So hello everybody and thank you for letting me speak here today. My name is uh, Pernille Frederiksen and I'm from the Danish Agency for Culture and Palaces, which is a governmental institution and the official name for the Danish Heritage Agency. So let's jump into it as we don't have so much time. Um, just to begin with, I want to explain to you what it is that we do at the agency. So in Denmark, we have about 32,000 scheduled monuments spread out all over the country. Uh, these monuments have been covered by a le legislation since 1937, which forbids any changes made to the state of the monument. So the agency oversees that this legislation is applied in a restrictive manner, which means that any drastic changes or removal of, an, of a monument needs to be permitted by the agency. So the monuments are in fact not only protected from, from uh, private people, but are also protected from archaeologists. And therefore, scheduled monuments in Denmark are almost never being excavated. The exception is, of course, if a monument is in risk of disappearing altogether, then you could permit archaeological excavations. Most of the cases that we handle in Denmark uh, are regarding man-made changes made on the monuments. For example, from agriculture, forestry, tourism, and so on. And these cases are somewhat easier to deal with because you can talk to a person, or in worst case, you can take legal actions against them, or you can maybe do information campaigns of, of uh, making people stop these damages on, on uh, monuments. But within the last decade, something has changed in the pattern of incoming cases. So within the last 10 years, we have experienced an increase in cases regarding damages on ancient monuments caused by coastal erosion. The incoming cases seem to peak in winter time after some horrible storms that we experienced um, from 2013 to 2017. So Denmark is a lowland country with a coastline of more than 7,000 kilometers. And the soils mainly consist of sand and clay. There are no really, there are no cliffs in Denmark except of uh, the easternmost part on the island of Bornholm. And therefore, the country is also especially vulnerable to increasing sea level rises and more extreme weather conditions. Yeah. And just to show you an example of damages due to coastal erosion, I brought you this illustration of a historical cemetery in the northwestern part of Denmark, where the erosion is really bad. I think this picture it illustrates uh, our problem very well, uh, as it shows you much of the coastal erosion has accelerated within the last decade or so. Of course, coastal erosion is not a new phenomenon. In fact, it has always existed. But what is new is the acceleration and the occurrence of damages being done in the coastal zone within the last couple of years. So, of course, we decided at the agency to get an overview of how bad things actually look like in the country. And therefore, we started the process of mapping all the scheduled monuments within the coastal zone in Denmark. So, as we started the mapping project a, a couple of years ago, we were actually very lucky because the same year, the Danish Coastal Authority released some reports regarding coastal erosion patterns and the effects of climate change in Denmark. So these reports showed that coastal erosion was going to be much worse in the future than anticipated just 10 to 20 years ago. One outcome of their work was this uh, web-based map showing all the erosion patterns in Denmark and the average erosion impact on the coastline. And up here you see the same site as before with the erosion data attached. And it shows that the erosion at this place is taking away about one meter of the coastline per year. So at the first part of the mapping, we gathered all the information on the erosion patterns 
At the second part of the mapping, we gathered the information in our own database about scheduled monuments using aerial photos, LIDAR scans, and 3D models in, in Global Mapper. And in that way, we were able to measure the distance between the monument and the coastline. So the results of the mapping showed that 711 scheduled ancient monuments are within 50 meters of the coastline. About 248 of the monuments are in risk of coastal erosion. And about 92 monuments are already under destruction due to coastal erosion. So in the continuing work, we decided to focus on monuments in risk of coastal erosion, marked with yellow on the map, and then monuments already under destruction, marked with red. We have divided the project into four stages. After the mapping, which is already done, follows a physical inspection of all the monuments, which is ongoing until 2019. The inspections are being carried out in collaboration with the local archaeological museums, and they then report back to the agency. Then we also made a plan for doing the uh, monitoring uh, in the future, maybe every year, every second year, or every fifth year. Then we have some fundraising, and when that's done, we can finally make an overall strategy of how to take action in the future and handle these cases. So I've tried to divide the different options we might have to take action in the future. The first one I'll skip here, as it might lead to a longer theoretical discussion. Then we have the options of coastal protection or sea protection, um, relocating monuments or keep monitoring the monuments in the future, which is what we are already doing. And then last but not least, of course, the option of archaeological surveys. And as I told you in the beginning, uh, scheduled monuments in Denmark are protected from archaeological ex excavations, but in these cases, it will make sense to open up for archaeological excavations in order to save important data before it disappears forever. So, coastal protection has already been used in some cases in order to protect <coughs> ancient monuments. Here you see an old church which lost its eastern part in the early 1900s. Soon thereafter, coastal protection in form of a concrete wall was made in front of the church. The thing is that the way the law works today, that this kind of coastal, hard coastal protection <coughs> is really expensive uh, to, to uh, maintain. A concrete wall, it cracks and it needs ongoing maintenance. In our experience, it's only possible to use coastal protection at places with a mild coastal erosion pattern, but building protection other places with strong erosion patterns would simply be a waste of uh, of money since it doesn't last without an everlasting upkeep. Yeah. So maybe it should only be done at, at places of high value, such as World Heritage Sites. Relocating monuments is also an option, but an expensive one too. Often it also includes a full excavation, followed by a full re uh, restoration, excavation and restoration inland. On the plus side, you maintain the monument in the landscape. But on the downside, you lose the authenticity and integrity attached to the monument. So far, the option has only been done on churches and dolmens in Denmark. The method might only be used forward in cases where monument, the monument is a danger to people. Then a good advice is to move the monument proper inland, otherwise you can do it again in 20 years or so. Last but not least, you have, of course, uh, the archaeological excavations. This is, of course, a way of gaining new important knowledge. In some monuments we have, um, preferably we don't give permission to excavate the entire monument, but just a part of it if the erosion pattern is at a steady place over a long time. And as you see this example, 
uh, the erosion actually created a perfect profile for us to, to investigate. So let's try and use that and let's keep the monument in the landscape as soon as, uh, as long as possible. So in this case, uh, we had to give an emergency permission to the archaeo archaeological uh, museum in Eastern Funen, since a Bronze Age sword from this Bronze Age barrow it had fallen down on the beach and an artist found it, picked it up. So these few examples that I already shown you, they've been funded by a very small budget we have at the agency for these exceptional cases, but it's not far enough to fund all the damages being done because they also have to cover the man-made damages due to agriculture um, damages and so on. So when we do get funded, I could have my concern because we need to be very clear from the beginning about the communication. What is it that we want to do about in our future pro uh, project? Um, when we get funded, this will be the biggest initiative regarding ancient monuments, get your monuments in Denmark, since 1937, when the legislation was actually established. So being a heritage agency, working for different governments and changing politicians, you need to be clear from the beginning what it is that you want to do. Otherwise, they will say, OK, your, your project has ended, and why haven't you saved all the heritage? Now you want more money again. So we need to be clear, as it was said yesterday, that we cannot save everything, but we can save something. And more important that is that we need to develop new methods to help us being quicker in these cases and act faster and, and learn how to handle cases better in the future. So thank you for your attention.